Gosh, we're two minutes late and the chat is nothing but, oh, they're late again. Oh, no. And administrator <laughs> says, I'm betting Jeff spilled his beer again. First off, how dare you? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the show, everyone. <laughs> Talking Heads, episode 321, your once week live show for the latest in beer and tech news. I'm Jeff. I'm Rhett. Thank you so much for joining us on this Wednesday night or in podcast form over on Anchor.fm or wherever your favorite podcasts are found. If you've never seen the show before, we talk beer, we talk tech, we talk games, pop culture, entertainment, sometimes some Star Trek. All Super Chats are read on the air so long as they will not permanently demonetize the channel, but an even better way to donate to the channel is to get yourself something as well. Head on over to craftcomputing.store, pick up one of our amazing nucleated pint glasses that are made to order in-house by me out in my garage on my laser cutter. Uh, we've also got coffee tumblers and a whole bunch of awesome, awesome merch, craftcomputing.store. Uh, last but not least, if you'd like to take part in the super secret chat and the even more super secret after party, think about joining the Patreon. Link is down in the video description and is yet another way you can give me money. Uh, perks of that are you can join the exclusive Discord server where you can talk to myself, John, Rhett, Steve, all the hosts from Talking Heads, and join the awesome community that hangs out over there. And welcome to the show. Michael says, Coffee Tumblr is awesome. I have been so happy with these. Like I, I've been daily driving this one since I prototyped it. Uh, this is my very first one that I did on that machine. It's amazing. Uh... And the texture is so good. I, I love the texture on this thing. Oh, how's it going, Rhett? Good. Happy yeah. Valentine's Day. Yes. Uh, yes. I don't have a Valentine's for you, but oh, dang it, I do. I do got a little bit of sh Valentine's Day champagne. I'll be drinking since you know I'm with you instead of my uh, significant other. So yes, yes. <laughs> And with you, uh, viewers. Yes. Uh, well, yeah, I don't, I, I, I do didn't plan on bringing champagne. Well, Jeez. you know, I'm just, uh, bring out the champagne. Yeah. <laughs> More champagne. <laughs> Leela, get over here. It's real velour. <laughs> uh, Not only yeah. is it Valentine's Day, Jeff, it's. Oregon's birthday. So it is Oregon's birthday. Our one hundred and fifty fourth or something. I don't yeah, know. I was gonna say one fifty second, but I'm probably wrong. I think it was eighteen fifty nine. Oh, one hundred sixty five. So oh, there we, go. we were was, way off. Yeah. For some reason, one hundred and fifty feels like not that long ago. Yeah, I know. Fifteen <laughs> years ago, huh? Yeah. We're going to hit 200 here pretty quick. Yeah. We'll be laughing about it on the show. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be like, oh, remember when it used to be just 165 years old and we laughed about it? it was God, if I'm still doing this show in 35 years, things have gone horribly wrong for me. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> What? YouTube's not that sustainable, man? Come on. I'm here for a years. good time, but maybe not that long of a time. <laughs> like, what episode would that be even? It's episode 321 now in 35 years. It'll be like... <laughs> yeah. It uh, reminds me there's this lady on TikTok that does the uh, like NPR voice, but from the future. I can't even remember what year it is, but she's like... <laughs> Uh, she's like, welcome back. I'm, you know, I'm Linda can of Coke. And, uh, today is February 14th, 3,128. Uh, this song comes from such and such hearkening back to a time before the male behavior implant chip. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually pretty funny. You guys yeah. should look it up if you like TikToks. I, you said NPR voice and, and my brain didn't go there. Uh, for like, you know, we're from the future or something like that. Mine went to uh, Conan O'Brien in the year 2000. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> uh, those were always classic. Uh, speaking of classic, uh, there's a classic way to start this show. 
you beat me to the punch by uh, by opening a beverage, so allow me to join you. Uh, I did bring uh, a beer too, by the way. Just just in excellent. Case. Well, I've well I've got two, so so we'll catch up midway through the show. Uh, I've been, you know, we live in IPA mecca, uh, and as much as I love IPAs, what's funny is I don't get the craving for German and Belgian style beers around October. I usually get them midway through the winter. And so January, February, I'm usually craving some, you know, nice hearty German beers. Uh, so last week I had a, uh, uh gosh i don't even remember what it was um it was but it was from monkless belgian ales over in bend oregon uh today i have their hazy day in brussels it is a double dry hopped belgian style trapel uh clocking in at i think this one 8.6 8.6 percent strong yes very strong so a little Hazy IPA inspired Belgian Trapel. We do live in an IPA mecca, and so when I go to open my other beer, Jeff, yeah, uh, it's going to be Fort George's Fresh IPA. Ooh, um, a delightfully refreshing fresh IPA. Um, clocking it, I think like six point four percent. Yeah. Nice. Ah, that looks so good in that glass. <laughs> and the nucleation is doing work. Nice. Ah, oh, it's going to be a good show. Uh, I say seven minutes into it. Uh, Broadcom, doing what Broadcom does. Uh, on this day of love, Broadcom decided to call their customers. Uh, Canada to ban the Flipper Zero for a reason that Flipper's being caught in the crossfire for. Uh, you see that a, a GM reference inside of there? <laughs> mm. uh, Very well done. Very well done. <laughs> Windows 11 is going to uh, no longer support or no longer even boot for some unsupported hardware uh, as of the latest update. So might leave some customers out in the cold, but. I've got more on that story, and we've got even more after that. But uh, what are people drinking over in the chat? Uh, those who, I don't think I said it in this one, but uh, if you're drinking along with us, leave us a, a chat, and uh, what are you drinking? We'll try to give some shout-outs. Uh, those who watch the show for a while started dropping them early on. Uh, let's see, we've got... Allison Pell is apparently yes. drinking the first ever uh, beer along with the show. So, um, Allison, all... long time viewer. Thank yeah. you for joining and uh, glad you can crack one with us tonight. Cheers Isn't to that you. shocking? Which is as long as they've been watching the show, this is the first time they've drank along, at least with a beer. So, yeah. and apparently, it's an Aldi's uh, Rheinbacher Pilsner imported German made to the purity law. Light and pleasant. Mmm, yum. Well, I, I believe Allison is from a, a far eastern time zone, and so I won't tell your employer if you don't. <laughs> yeah, ju judging by the time they put on there, yeah. Uh, they say that they uh, drink, usually they're drinking coffee along with the show at 2 a.m., so. Yeah. Uh, which which puts them somewhere in a European time zone, of course, if they're buying their beer from an Aldi's, so. Yeah, it's, that's where I thought they were, so. Uh, let's see. Jason says, good evening, y'all. Good evening. Uh, Elmo says, hello. Rev says, cheers. And let's see. Scrolling down for some beer. Still scrolling, still scrolling. I know there's some that There's a lot. Come on, man. We got Elmest. He's drinking a black chocolate stout from Brooklyn Brewery. It's 10%. Nice. We got, uh... Rev. Rev. Cracking a Jester King Urban Mutation Farmhouse Ale, a collab with Other Half. It's a barrel aged Saison, re fermented with Matika hop infused honey. 5.3%. It's a four out of five on Untapped. Solid. I don't know if I said Matika right. I came right up to that. I just rolled with it. Uh, Muteka, I believe is. Muteka. I'm going to say Matika. Yeah, 
I'm going to stick with my guns on that one. I don't care if I'm wrong. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Michael's drinking a Sierra Nevada Hot Bullet Magnum Edition. That is a fantastic beer. I've had that one a couple times. Uh, Imperial IPA, 9.5%. Uh, uh, Cap and Tack had me some green chili cheeseburgers and tater tots. Now enjoying uh, some Argyle Nut House Pinot Noir. Excellent. Uh, Matt's uh, Dainton Beer Equalizer Hazy Pale Ale 4.5% in my new Craft Computing Pint Glass. Nice. Mm -hmm. Oh, Skull's got one of my favorites. Stone again. Brewing Fear Movie Lions. May have to break out the Dragon's Milk and Port to make Jeff jealous again. <laughs> that was... Uh, for those who don't know, we have an after party on the Discord server where we turn on cameras and people just live chat. And, and I, nine times out of 10, will join that. And uh, we usually crack another beverage and, and have some fun. Uh, talking about whatever. Uh, anything goes on that chat. And it's a heck of a lot anything. of fun. Anything. He means it. Anything. A little craft computing after dark. Uh, <laughs> some people take their shirts off. They go shirts for skins. Right. Uh, last week, we dove into the Mystic Libations uh, book. Uh from oh, Todd nice. Stashwick. Uh, and we had a Braythorn brew. Uh, I believe it's Braythorn. Brethorn, something like that. It's the very first cocktail in Todd Stashwick's D&D inspired Mystic Libations cocktail recipe book. Um, of which I have an autographed copy. It is one of my favorite items that I own. Um, and uh, the Braythorn brew is 12 ounces of a Dragon's Milk Stout which is a bourbon or a yeah, bourbon barrel aged stout, uh 12.5% from New Holland Brewing. Uh and 4 ounces of a chocolate port wine. Uh so Scott or a skull broke one out last week. I happen to have some chocolate port and I happen to have some dragon's milk, but I didn't go just standard dragon's milk. I went for the 14% rye and cinnamon uh uh reserve bottle. So Mine was extra spicy and extra delicious. And Thursday sucked. <laughs> Sounds tasty. By the way, that was also after cracking open a Bourbon County Stout uh, on the show and drinking that solo. So Wednesday was a long night. Oh... Somebody's Today, drinking a nice glass of here. isopropyl. <laughs> Solid 70%. Yum. <laughs> and let's see. Let's do one more. Sean, local brewery beer tonight. Canteen Brew House Exodus IPA, 7.2% and 70 IBU. Uh, where's Canteen Brew House at? I'm curious. It's near the canteen. It's in Albuquerque. New, New Mexico. Mexico. There you go. On Aztec Road. Well, cheers to that. Uh, we do have a couple super chats to get to. Uh, we'll start with the latest from Daryl. Sends over a couple Aussie bucks. Thank you very much, Daryl. Uh, trying to comment about Aldi beer in Aus, but no spa. Not quite sure what that means. <laughs> I know what I know what Aldi is, uh, but uh, but no spa. Not not quite sure. Who knows? Skull says he claims no responsibility for Jeff's rough Thursday last week. Um, yes, you do. Yes, you do. Uh, but we also have another super chat from Tripic. Thank you very much, my my friend. Uh, sends over five Kiwi bucks. Uh, we got our VMware refresh bill for one of our sites, and it was. 17 times larger than last year. Which is a fantastic segue into our very first topic. Nice. Broadcom. Uh, I already made the joke, but uh, it bears repeating. On this day of love, decided to fuck their customers. Uh, Broadcom, continuing their sweep of making sure they piss off every last one of their customers, even potential customers, uh, by yesterday announcing that... VMware will end 
its free variant of its software. Uh, end of general availability of free vSphere hypervisor. Uh, for those who don't know, VMware for the longest time has offered essentially a free, license-free version of vSphere, uh, which is their hypervisor software. Uh, if you ran a very small organization, if you were a hobbyist, if you wanted a lab, if you wanted to tinker with something that professionals were using, uh, this was a fantastic option. Uh, but like all things, when uh, companies decide to buy other companies and go, we're gonna turn this thing profitable, uh, which VMware was already very profitable. Uh, they are deciding to squeeze this lemon dry and end their free software. Which means the only way to use VMware vSphere now is to buy VMware vSphere. Mind you, those licenses were never cheap or affordable, uh, even for, like I said, small, medium business or, or home lab, which is why the statements I made a couple of weeks ago about VMware may own 45% of the market share, but you are far more likely to find uh, Hyper-V or KVM in small medium business environments because of the cost factor. Uh, yeah. Uh, as Serve the Home writes, uh, shout out to, uh, to Mr. Patrick Kennedy. Uh, this is a huge deal for the VMware ecosystem. It's a bit of a different scope between this and Red Hat goes full IBM saying farewell to CentOS. The real reason for the VM free version of VMware vSphere hypervisor was to get folks on board VMware. Now, anyone looking to get into the v VMware ecosystem will have to pay. Uh, and that's really the crux of this. Um, and long-term maybe shooting themselves in the foot because Kind of like Cisco, VMware loved training people in high school and college on how to use Cisco and how to use VMware. So when you went out into the workforce and got a real job, you brought VMware and Cisco training with you. If VMware is no longer going to exist in lab environments and no longer going to exist in college labs and no longer going to exist in home labs and no longer going to exist in small and medium business at all because it's literally not affordable, uh, that severely narrows your pool of qualified VMware admins. It narrows the scope. It uh, widens the knowledge gap between those who simply work in virtualization and those who might need to administer a VMware vSphere environment. Uh, that's a big deal. That's a really big deal. Uh, and these are the kind of decisions that just like Microsoft buying Activision and then laying off 1,900 employees is likely a short-sighted, let's make sure the CEO gets his pay bonus this month and uh, or this quarter or this year, whatever, um, that you'll be paying for later on because you've now created a much wider skill gap. Uh, and the Microsoft one boggles my mind because Activision was already highly profitable. That's why you bought them. So let's fire a very large percentage of staff who are already working with, you know, Activision IPs and things like that. And uh, screw it, we'll just roll those those IPs over into other departments or other studios. Well, there's a reason that those IPs are successful and it's because of all the insider knowledge uh, that goes into developing every year's Call of Duty and, and Overwatch and, and everything else that goes along with it. This is one of these decisions that will bite VMware eventually. Uh, but as long as Broadcom and their CEO and, and the board all get their bonuses and shareholders get, get what they want this quarter, everyone else. It's all a race to the bottom, my friend. Yep.
Doesn't matter the industry. Terrific. Sends over another five. Thank you, sir. Uh, we're looking for alternatives and looking at moving our 10 offices and 50 rack data center to different options like XCPNG or OpenStack. Um, I've heard some great things about both platforms. Uh, I know a couple of uh, smaller cloud providers that use OpenStack and are thrilled with it. Uh, especially for an internal data center, I think both of those are solid options. Um, as much as I love Proxmox, um, they're... I don't know how well their management system would actually scale to something like that. Uh, I think it's, I think Proxmox's management is fantastic for a single site, single rack, maybe even multi-rack in a single organization. But once you start going multi-multi-rack, uh, you're dealing with synchronizations, you're dealing with you know redundant data and all that kind of stuff. I don't think the tool set and the management set is quite there. Um, unless you're willing to build it yourself, unless you have your own storage ecosystem that you already manage externally or you already manage with a, a third tool. Um, I don't think Proxmox is the answer. Proxmox is a fantastic uh, single site, single rack, home lab, single organization type setup though. Uh, but no, OpenStack, I'd put my money behind OpenStack if it were me. Not that I have anything against Zen. <laughs> Oof, glad you could get that in there at the end. I was not looking forward to the social media tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't mention Zen. Get him. Get him. <laughs> uh, what's a Ventoy? I was just trying to think of the dang video that it was for. <laughs> it's never going to die. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> I couldn't remember Ventoy fast enough. Uh, that is actually a meme that is spread to other tech channels now, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. More Super Chess flying in. We did miss uh, Cosworth's... Uh, one up above. Oh, shoot. Raising Cosworth. a glass. Yes, Cosworth, $5. Thank you very much, good sir. Raising glass to telling your spouse not to look at home assistance cameras after Hawks visit the duck coop on Valentine's Day. <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day, honey. Nothing bad happened. Nothing bad happened. I'm sorry, bro. <laughs> mm. Wow. That, uh, that's got to be fun to clean up. Is, is everyone okay? I mean, no. I know, I know no. some things not, are not okay, but is everyone okay? Uh, Codsworth, another five bucks. Thank you. Uh, so, will we ever see a Jeff rips apart? I mean, comments on Unraid video. Um, I've said many times, Unraid has its place. <laughs> uh, Unraid very much has its place. Um, it it has its advantages. Uh, the the JBOD mentality and the I can do almost anything, but to about sixty percent of the ability of the things that were purpose built for those things. That's kind of my opinion of Unraid. Um, and it's not that that's a bad niche to fill. Uh, my needs are usually beyond what Unraid can deliver outside of storage expansion. Uh, I don't have a lot of archival storage that I don't frequently access. And so storage speed and storage latency is a huge piece of my workflow, regardless of what I'm accessing, um, outside of like Plex. But Plex is like eight to 10 terabytes of my 160 terabyte array. Uh, <laughs> the rest of my storage is offline game storage for game installers. Uh, and I want those to run at more than 25 megabytes per second. Uh, it is footage that I'm pulling up from craft computing. I have almost 80 terabytes worth of video footage now. Um, and while not all of it needs to be, you know, on NVMe and as fast as it can go, if I need a file and it's a 130 gigabyte file, I'm not waiting to pull that file off. I, I need it accessible and I need it quick. And so most of my use cases don't mesh 
with what Unraid does, which is a lot of storage for fairly inexpensive, fairly secure. I need as quick of storage as I can and cost kind of be damned. Uh, so, but Unraid now supports ZFS natively uh, since the Linux kernel uh, integrated uh, OpenZFS as part of the stack. And so you can use ZFS on, on Unraid. That's fantastic. Unraid, I don't think, is as robust of a hypervisor. You can do PCI Express pass-through, uh, but I, I like some of the other settings of, of proxy. I like the, the modularity and the ah, specificity at which you can dial in Proxmox. And and it's it's all KVM in the back end. Proxmox and, and Unraid both use KVM as their actual hypervisor backends. Um, I like the menu system that you get with Proxmox and the feature set you get a little bit better over on that side. Um, so yeah, it's nothing against Unraid. It just doesn't necessarily fit my needs. And I've never had much of a need to investigate it because it doesn't fit my needs. And that's fine. It's the funny thing about tech and, and like tech comments, like, and Ventoy is the perfect example of that, where it's like, there's just so many options out there in general mm -hmm. that if something like if there's something that's much more specific to your use case, like you might just end up using that and never knowing or caring about the other options. Right. <laughs> but that's like almost not enough. You know, everybody's like, no, you got to know everything. You got to you got to make content about everything, Jeff. Right. Deck tube. Right. Um, on my channel, I have done content on Proxmox, on Hyper-V, on uh, ESXi, and on Zen. I, I've done content on all of that. And I've done virtualization on TrueNAS and FreeNAS. I've covered five hypervisors on this channel. And people are pissed off that I don't cover the sixth. <laughs> Maybe someday. I, I've used them in all kinds of different use cases. You know what else I've never covered? Docker. Because Docker doesn't fit with a lot of my internal use cases. It's not something that I am uh, overly enthusiastic about. Uh, my theory on Docker is why would I run a, a sandboxed kernel when I could just run a virtual machine? Because running inside Docker, the problem is you're running on the kernel. And if you ever need to upgrade kernel, you have to upgrade every single process and every single dependency for every subsystem you have within your Docker setup. Um, that's the way containers work. I would much rather pull the trigger and upgrade individual VMs and, and the host itself when I need to upgrade those, those devices and, and not have to wait until everything reaches a consistent mesh level and then try to do everything in one fell swoop because things are going to break and things do break. Um, I've never looked into Kubernetes because I don't have the need for highly available or multi-node systems. Uh, it's not a use case that I cover a lot. Um, most of my VM work is, is usually very purpose-driven and very single client or small business oriented. And so it's delivering all of your data to a single client as fast as humanly possible, not necessarily being a to scale up to, oh, let's say we had 50 Plex users. I don't know 50 people, let alone let 50 people on my Plex server. And so it's not a need I've ever had. Um, and that's not to say I'm not interested in it. That's not to say it's not good technology. It doesn't fit my needs. And so I've never fully investigated uh, how I would demo it on this channel because there's people who already do it better. Yeah. I think that's a good point too. Is, is even if you did use every single tool out there, there's not really possibly enough time for you to become an expert enough in them all that you can write intelligently about them and mm -hmm. present them intelligently. Yeah, leave it to the people that know those tools. You know, keyboard reviews, man. <laughs> uh, look, I don't do a lot of keyboard reviews, although I am definitely a keyboard lover. Uh, I. I wouldn't go as far as enthusiast. I'm not an enthusiast about much, honestly. I'm an enthusiast for tech and and I will dive down certain rabbit holes. And um, 
I have found the devices as far as keyboards and peripherals and mice and things like that, that I truly do like and use. And, and I have refined those to the nth degree, but I'm also not the person that builds 13 keyboards and hang them, hangs them on my wall. Like it's, <laughs> it's not the enthusiast level in me. The enthusiast level in me goes, I have narrowed down to what is my favorite switch, my preferred layout, the things that I want, the feature set that I want, the things that I don't want. And uh, and refining your tastes specifically. Um, but that's not to say that I can't do a generic keyboard review. Um, but what's really funny is because I don't live in that world 24-7, 365. If you get one term wrong, you will be lambasted by the enthusiasts of that community. And the problem is there's so many tech communities out there that are like that, that it makes it really difficult for an enthusiast in tech in general to dip their toe in that water. It's the Linux community, but on steroids. Uh, like, Careful, bro. Careful. I've, They're watching. <laughs> I have daily driven Linux in some capacity for 15 years, if not longer. Uh, no, it, going back to almost 20 years now. 2004, 2005, I think I first really started like using Linux. Uh, and uh, I know Linux. Do I know every nook and cranny of it? No. If you live in that world, fantastic. If you are a Linux admin, if you are a Linux developer and you live in that world, fantastic. Don't come at me because I use Nano instead of Vim. Don't <laughs> come at me because I configured something a different way than you would. Don't co The cool thing about these communities is there's always more ways to do it than the way you prefer. And what I try to give you on my channel is an explanation of how I got there. So... <laughs> well, and, and that leads me to the next great point, which is that we have a super chat, mm -hmm. uh, $5 from Terror Pup. Thank you, sir. Uh, having a great week doing a deployment of an app drinking a beer and play with the foreman on my home lab nice mikey d also drops 10 canadian dollars we accept those thank you so much Ooh, i love canadian dollars they've I do got love. pictures yeah. of a real pretty lady on them <laughs> wait which place in canada did you go <laughs> that wasn't real money my friend <laughs> Uh, no, thank or you, maybe it, maybe it's Elton John on them. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it could be. Could be. Uh, v is for Valentine, Ventoy, and VMware. And now V is for going back to VirtualBox. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Are we really at the point of help us, Oracle? You're my only hope. Oh, God, I hope not. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> Honestly, for those who want to get into home labbing and don't want to spend a lot of extra money on hardware, um, this actually might be a great video to make. Turn on Hyper-V on your home desktop. You've got a 13900K, you've got 14 or you have 24 cores and 32 threads. You don't need them all for gaming. Use your efficiency cores and start a home lab on your desktop. There's a video concept. I think I'm going to do that. I think I'm going to make that video. Uh, Cosworth says $2. Unread can do VGPU now. It's a pain. Um, VGPU was always a pain. Um, <laughs> Why do you think the videos uh, in Craft Computing are so long? <laughs> Terrapup says Craft Computing, if you had to pick, TrueNAS, OMV, or Unraid. TrueNAS, period. End of discussion. Because TrueNAS fills my needs. I love the I love the power of ZFS. I, I love the feature set of ZFS uh, way more than I love cheap expandability. Uh, and I know Unraid does ZFS now, um, but TrueNAS has been doing ZFS for fifteen years, twelve years, something like that. Um, I also first started experimenting with FreeNAS. I think also in about two thousand five. Um, uh, I had a, uh, I had an old HP desktop with a Celeron three gigahertz in it, uh, single core, like 
because that was all that what there was in that day. Uh, and I remember downloading FreeNAS because I wanted a network storage pool that I could save all of my stuff to and then access from my laptop and my desktop and a couple other devices without just using Windows file sharing, which, good God, anyone try Windows file sharing in Windows XP days? Oh my <laughs> God. Oh yeah, went yeah. to a lot of LAN parties, baby. Yeah. So, no, I, I set myself up a free NAS server, I believe, in 2005. Um, so, I've been with it for a long time. I did open my uh, beer. I couldn't wait for you. No. Um, once more, it's the Fort George Fresh IPA, Fresh Hop India Pale Ale, uh, and it is unfiltered. It is super... There's like a lot of sediment, almost like uh, almost like pulp in there, and it is beautiful. It tastes so good. Mm. Nice. That sounds delicious. It is, you know, and you know me. Like I'm not, I'm not an IPA guy, but mm -hmm. man, sometimes a solid IPA. <laughs> I say I'm not an IPA guy. <laughs> <laughs> I was I gonna let it slide. IPA. You know, I drink a lot of IPAs for not being an IPA guy. I'm not one of those not an IPA guys that won't ever drink one. Yeah, I drink quite a few, but they're not my preference. But like, it's just so gorgeous. Like, yeah. oh, and it tastes great. Very, very aromatic. Very, very uh, vegetal, to quote Jeff. And um, yeah, we'll see how it evolves. But it's it's good. Nice. I love Fort George is just nailing it for me lately. Fort George is one of those breweries. Everything they make is gold. Everything they make is good. And I mean, like, genuinely good. Like, you know, their lowest scoring beer has got to be like a 3.75 out of 5. <laughs> like, everyone likes it. Most people love it. Like, yeah. that's kind of what I get out of Fort George for every yeah. single beer they've ever produced and every one that I've ever had. As a little social experiment, while we were just talking tech literally two minutes ago, we were at like 207 viewers. I mentioned beer, and now we're at 189. <laughs> <laughs> it, it do be like that, don't it? <laughs> That's all right. We know, we'll get them we back. Know who our, we know who our fans are. We'll get them back. So, it, it dipped momentarily. Yeah, we were at 208. So We were pretty high there for a bit, yeah. 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 Um, uh, we got another super chat. Nameless Horror sends over five bucks. Thank you very much. Uh, explaining to the vice president that saves everything to his desktop why we can't use a Windows container on a Linux host is always fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, the people who know either just enough to be dangerous or the people who hear the latest buzzword and go, why can't we just containerize it? <laughs> How could we implement AI? Those are the most dangerous people. The people who don't know why they want it, but they want it because they heard they they had to have it. Those are the most dangerous people. Those are the leaders that I always look at and say, why are you paying me? You're paying you know, me because you're a great leader. You're a great business builder. You're a great manager. You don't know what I do. You don't know how to build a server. If you knew how to build a server, your ass would be in there building a server because you're a cheap son of a bitch. <laughs> you don't know how to do that. So please let me manage it. Please let me run this. If you have specific needs of me, and I mean needs, state your needs. I need my files to appear this way on my desktop. I need... I, I want to make sure we're backed up. I want to make sure that if I make a mistake, I can revert something. Hey, if something goes down, what's our remediation process? Those are needs. Not, I need to see containers on the server. That's not a need. That's you placing words in my mouth. The reason you hired me is I know more than you about this. Let me manage it. I mean, the crazy thing about the tech industry, Jeff, is when you break it down, it's just run by normal business people. <laughs> you know, yep. like, 
you have a few bi- uh, companies that do really well for themselves with very intelligent, uh, very yep. uh, knowledgeable people at the top. And then you have a lot of companies that don't. By the way, that advice isn't just about tech. That advice is about all things that a business manager might encounter. Hey, do you know how to frame up a house? Maybe give the general contractor some space. <laughs> hey, do you know, you know, do you know how to properly wire a three phase? Maybe let the electrician do his job. Like, it's it's all a matter of we're all experts in some things and we're complete morons in others. I'm a complete moron in a lot of different facets. I'm not going to tell you what they are because you'll pick at them. There's a, there's <laughs> but, a sound bite right there, guys. Get it. I'm a moron in a lot of different facets. Right. <laughs> but it, it's it's kind of uh, reminds me a little bit of um, I was just listening to the Behind the Bastards podcast with uh, Robert Evans, and he had just gone to CES. Mm-hmm. And he was at CES. He's very interested in AI and, and all this type of stuff. And um, all of these AI corporate people were giving a, a some type of panel speaking event and this person i wish i could remember the details but it's it's on one of the latest behind the bastards episodes about uh, the cult of ai uh, i think it's called something like that the cult of ai or or ai bros are forming a cult something like that and anyway long story short uh the 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 ceo of this new ai company is saying well you know Google has used our product and they say it's the same as getting like uh, 1 million new employees, you know, and they're using it to battle fraud and all of this stuff. And this company got it and they're saying that it's, it's boosted their productivity. And, and Robert Evans asked, well, you know, it's great that the good guys have this, but don't the bad guys have it too? Like if they're saying that they have boosted their fraud fighting ability by 1 million employees, isn't that also like, don't the are, are aren't the fraudsters boosting their numbers by one million employees? <laughs> and the CEO was just like, uh, uh, I don't, uh, I don't think so. Like, had no answer for anybody that was critical about it. Mm-hmm. And it was one of those things you see. It's just like another business person who just had no idea about the technology that they were speaking about. Or yeah, uh, really interesting episode. If anybody's into into that, it's a great podcast. Yeah, that's a great segue into our very next segment actually uh first off we've got a super chat uh matt sends over ten dollars thank you very much matt long time silent follower first time stuck getting into proxmox and trying to migrate the data from a docker container uh on a different pc to a vm here can't seem to find the file structure on the vm um the vm is just a separate computer uh, the file structure within the VM exists on a, a hard drive container, a, a VHD, a virtual hard drive file. Um, that, uh, that file is basically another hard drive. Think, think of it as a hard drive that's plugged into a completely separate PC. Ignore the fact that it's running in a VM. Ignore the fact that it's inside of your server. Think of it as another PC. How would I get files to that PC over the network? Uh, So, if you have the files from your container, you can drop them into a folder, um, or you can drop them onto a file share. You can then, from your VM, map that file share and pull those files in. Uh, It is a completely separate instance. Uh, In almost every case, you can't just drag and drop files. You can't transfer from host to VM or anything else you have to utilize network resources or or some other method to get data across. Hope that helps. Hope that gets you on the right track. Uh, but uh, <laughs> a lot of container talk and uh, Novella Hub says, now I'm picturing Kip from Napoleon Dynamite breaking the Tupperware under the van. <laughs> You know, I just watched Napoleon Dynamite like a week ago, and that movie holds up, man. It's so funny. <laughs> and of course, the main actor who plays Napoleon Dynamite is from Salem, so. He's a local. 
Uh, what about free VMware? What's happening? VMware is no longer free, period. Uh, they have pulled uh, vSphere free version 7 and version 8 from general availability. You can no longer download it. Uh, get after pay up. Sincerely, Broadcom. <laughs> there, you're caught up. Uh, speaking of people making decisions with absolutely no information on a subject, Canada is set to ban the Flipper Zero. Hey, look, I happen to have mine right here. Uh, why would they ban the Flipper Zero? A, a hacking little device that is meant to be a, a tinkerer's paradise for RF and, and other things that are, number one, perfectly legal to do. Okay, let's, let's put that out there. Uh, NFC, HID, RFID, all that kind of stuff. You can copy, you can clone, you can recreate. Um, you can scan radio waves uh, and recreate those signals. Uh, why would they ban the Flipper Zero? Well, apparently car thefts are huge in Canada. And they're banning the Flipper Zero because of car thefts. Hmm. The one thing the device can't do. Literally doesn't have the capability of doing literally doesn't have the requisite hardware to be able to do that. And that's from car thieves. <laughs> <laughs> no, you cannot get on Amazon and buy a car stealing device for $180. Oh, come it doesn't on. Work that way. Really? Believe Dang it or it. not, this hackable little device does have some safeguards, does have some things, even with custom firmware, which I have custom firmware installed on mine, that it's still just flat out not capable of doing. And one of them is stealing a car. I guess I have to go to the manufacturer and order the keys direct. Right. Dang it. Now, what is this all about? Obviously, car thefts are up. Uh, there's been a lot of scrutiny pointed towards Kia and Hyundai in particular for their lack of certain security measures when it comes to their key systems uh, in their cars. There's also a rampant number of thefts using a... Uh, a relay attack. What is a relay attack? A relay attack is where someone walks up to your front door close enough to where your keys might be with a receiver that can read the RFID or NFC or whatever else device that's inside of your key fob. They will relay that signal over to someone who's standing by your car close enough to get it to proximity unlock. They will then sit in the car. The car thinks the key is in there. They start the car and they drive away. Now, why can they drive away without the key? Well, you don't need the key once the car is started. Because can you imagine if the battery on your key fob died and you're on the highway and your car goes, oh, sorry, and shuts off and locks your brakes up? That can't happen. And so once a car is started, it can be driven wherever. Oh, yeah. Uh, so that's a relay attack. That's how thieves are stealing cars. What can the flipper do? The flipper can read the signal coming off of a, a an RF remote. Uh, so if your car relies on an RF remote, I've done this myself, you can read the codes on your flipper. Um, I've held my truck key next to it and gone boop boop and gone, oh, look, I caught something. You know what happens if I play it back? Nothing. Period. Because every car made since about 1995, 94 maybe, uses not a standard set of RF codes. They use what's called a rolling code. It is a random new code every single time that key fob is pressed. Once a code is used, it can't be used again, or at least in a relatively long period of time. Think like a course of, you know, a decade, okay? Um, so the car receiver will go, I received this code. That code's no longer valid after I've received it. Next time it receives another code. Oh, that's a new code. Guess what? That code's no longer valid. So every time your remote transmits a code, it checks a box on your car's receiver and that car receiver will no longer respond to that code again for a very, very long time. Uh, the only way you could get a flipper to steal a code and be able to reuse it, and again, this would be a one-off thing, 
would be a single code would be to have the flipper receive the code while also emitting a blocking signal to the car. Or could you do it? Uh, I wonder if you could engage the fob while you're out of range of the car and get the code that way. Would that work? Uh, potentially. Potentially. That was my first thought. Because imagine you're in the big parking lot, you know, and you're like, where is my car? And you're like, you're out of range. You don't hear it yet. You're like, I got to get closer. I think that would work. But again, you're you're splitting into a... An I'm esoteric. not defending this. <laughs> right. I'm just I'm just thinking like, okay, well, if there's yeah. this one, you know, way it could work. I believe there are also safeguards in that in some some vehicles in some uh, circumstances. Maybe it's a two part code. Uh, sometimes call it is. A, sometimes it is call response. Sometimes it is call response. Call response. It is remote send signal to car. Car receive signal. Send signal back to remote to say, don't use this code again. Um, sometimes it is a two-way communication. Uh, so, yes. Uh, but you could, in theory, receive a code, block the transmission of that code to the car. So the car doesn't receive that signal. And I think being out of range may be one of those, but it's one of those things. If you have physical access to the keys to be able to enact that, you've already got the golden ticket. Why not just take the damn keys? <laughs> and I think that's the, the crux of this argument. Let's get his keys out of reach and then initiate a call from the key and capture it on my flipper, which has a 30 foot range. No, no, Do you no, see no. the problem far, with this? <laughs> far easier to park the car in a completely lead-based garage. Actually, no one of the recommendations <laughs> is to start keeping your keys in a Faraday cage. Of course it is. Of course it is. Welcome to the 21st century. Um, but uh, Flipper has already said that any modern car after about 200, uh, after about 2000, the Flipper is absolutely useless against. Right. Uh, the, the code... The code receive call transmit that we're talking about was valid for like six or seven years from like 94 when they started instituting rolling codes to about 2000, 2002 when they got a lot smarter and did call response stuff. So yes. And yeah, a flipper cannot emulate a rolling code and it also cannot receive a validation signal. Can't we? Well, we, I'm not Canadian. <laughs> Thank God. No, kidding. <laughs> but hey, guy. <laughs> but can't we focus this like legislative fear her, fear her fury against like important things that do actual damage to people and things and property? Like, I have a question. Hmm. Can we hold Kia and Hyundai responsible for their bullshit code reenacting? Or I mean, if we can, then this opens a whole can of worms for other manufacturers of objects which harm people in more active ways. But I don't know. I guess that's just me. I guess that's just the power of regulation, huh? Which, by the way, a flipper still can't be used to steal a Kia or a Hyundai. The attacks are still more elaborate than this device allows. This device is really cool. This device can do a lot of things, like get you free arcade plays at a place that uses RFID cards. Ask me how I know. Uh, but, <laughs> but it cannot steal a car. I mean, look, unless you carve There's it a into... narrow window for like, rem like uh, remote keyless entry from like 1989 to 1994, you might be able to use the flipper. But those are things that have the security of a garage door opener. Guess what also improved over the years? Garage door openers. <laughs> <laughs> you can't just roll down the street anymore and blast RF code and have garages open. You know why? Because garage door openers also use rolling codes now. Yeah. 
That uh, PC Mag article also says uh, at the very end, uh, you can use screwdrivers to steal cars too. Does this mean you intend to make sure Canadians don't have access to any digital tools? Right. The, the funny thing is, is uh, I get legislatures, legislatures, there we go, uh, want to enact change, want to hold things accountable, want to hold companies, people, whatever, accountable for whatever things are going wrong at the moment. But aim at it. Yeah. Yeah. But just because you heard, <laughs> oh, the flipper's a hack, a wireless hacking device. We need to ban the flipper so we don't lose any more cars You know that Jeff, Kia and Hyundai are almost exclusively responsible for. Put yourself into their positions for one moment. I beg you, put yourself in their shoes. I can't get my head that far up my you, ass, but I will try. <laughs> you hold a virtually useless job. <laughs> And here you have an opportunity to pass something without any fight. I love how you're battling through it. <laughs> I'm just like, people want health care and to not get shot and to be able to have a house. And you know what? Instead, we're going to focus on the flipper. Yep. <laughs> I don't know. It's just so funny. Again, it's really easy to sympathize with them if you put yourself into the position of like, okay, I can't do any of the things I was elected to do. That's impossible. But this, I mean, we got an automobile regulation industry for a reason, and I'm going to flex those muscles, you right. know? I mean, look. What if reason? Sandy Hook had been done with a flipper, they would have been gone. You know, but they weren't. So, <laughs> no, you'd have Alex Jones out there touting <laughs> about it was never that way. And you'd also have people go, but what about my right to bear a flipper? The flipper's turning the frogs gay. <laughs> I use I use my flipper for the uh, remote sprayers for the, the chemtrails. Works every time. <laughs> uh, Do you know what I use my flipper for? Do you know the primary use of my flipper? Amiibos. Second primary use of my flipper. <laughs> uh, what? It is my teleprompter remote. Oh, yeah. That, I remember when you got the flipper and it turned into the perfect teleprompter remote. It is the right that. size. It is absolutely perfect. It's got a D-pad and a button that control my teleprompter. Uh, so the reason you see a flipper on my desk more, more times than not is because every teleprompter remote on the market sucks. And this is the only one in which I downloaded an app that it emulates a Bluetooth remote and it has a presentation mode. And that presentation mode works with the teleprompter software that I like. And so I can use my flipper as a teleprompter remote. And it's amazing. <laughs> I cannot tell you how cool, <laughs> how good of a teleprompter remote the Flipper Zero is. I, I would have spent $180 on a teleprompter remote if it worked this well. <laughs> Isn't there, I, to me, that's the funny part about tech is that we just want something that does a thing well and there never is that thing until there is mm -hmm. something and then it gets banned by the Canadians for doing things too well. <laughs> for doing something it shouldn't have done in the first place. Yeah. Taylor Swift invented the flipper. Watch out, guys. <laughs> Oh, uh, my God. Somebody said uh, when I said that uh, probably about the, the, the comment about uh, the flipper turning the frogs gay, uh, Michael S. said, yes, RF signals do that. And I said, RF stands for return to female. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That should make me laugh as hard as it does, but it does. Uh, Mary you gotta be says, did you get a new camera, Red? It looks better. No. I didn't get a new camera. This is Better the light. other. He turned lights on. That's what he did. <laughs> yeah, I'm not using the Sony today. I'm using the Logitech. What's funny is he's on a worse camera today. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. Uh, what was it that could turn on your space heater? Oh, my short that I posted. Uh, that was my Roku remote. Oh yeah. Um, was, uh, so we had a, uh, a, a tower fan in my living room and, uh, 
I have my we use a Roku in almost every room. Uh, we we have TVs and Rokus everywhere, and uh, my Roku remote for some reason, even though it's programmed with the volume up, volume down directly from my remote, um, when I press volume up, it turns on the rotation of my fan. <laughs> Apparently the the IR codes are close enough to volume up for a Vizio TV and rotate on a tower fan. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, we found another button that does something else as well. Uh, there was something else that that interacted with it that I think we found off that Roku remote. But yeah, uh, the the short was when a custom when uh, when a customer says something about their tech believe them and that's actually something i always preach to techs that i trained uh i I trained a couple of different things number one this may be the millionth time you've heard this complaint and the millionth time you've responded to this certain issue for who you're talking to on the phone it's their first treat it like it's their first and so for any customer service oriented job that you're in Treat that interaction as the first time you've ever interacted with that person and the first time you've ever experienced this. You can bring your experience to help solve the problem, but in your explanation to the person about what you're doing, why you're doing it, what caused it, will it happen again, this needs to be their first time too. And so treat it as that. And that that applies, again, to all fields. That applies to retail. That applies to customer service that applies to tech that applies to a whole bunch of different areas uh interact with a customer who is potentially their first time interacting with you as if it was their first time you're eight out of ten on every review already period uh number two when they tell you of a problem believe them whether or not they got to the root cause they may be reporting a symptom But that symptom is still probably something that can lead you to a root cause. So believe them. And so if they say, uh, we had a great one. Speaking of remotes, we had a great one for a long time. Uh, We had, uh, uh, I did some work at a K-12. And uh, they had a Keyspan, Keyspan uh, remotes. that were their PowerPoint remotes. And the funny thing about PowerPoint remotes is they usually serve a couple of different features or functions. Uh, They have a dongle that plugs into the PC, and then they have a remote that they can hold out. Um, And much like trying to find the right teleprompter remote, there's certain buttons that do certain things. So in PowerPoint, there's start presentation, there's next slide, there's previous slide, there's start animation, there's volume up, there's volume down. There's a whole bunch of different functions on that remote. Do you know how those functions are achieved? Keyspan emulates a mouse. Also on Keyspan remotes is this little center nubble right there. Uh, IBM liked to call it a track point. It was an eraser head mouse that you could use to navigate to use as a laser pointer. The remote had a laser pointer on it, but let's say you wanted to use your mouse as a laser pointer. You could guide your cursor with that little track point head. About once a week, for 10 years, we would have someone call into our tech department and say, my mouse is acting really funny. Oh, can you explain what's happening? As if it's the first time I've heard this. And they would say, yeah, uh, Every time I move my mouse, it shoots to one side. So I'll, I'll, I'll pull my mouse down here. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be the mouse on red screen here. I'll, I'll pull my mouse to the side and do what I need to do. But as soon as I let go, it snaps up and away. Or it snaps to the left or it snaps to the right. It snaps to the side and I can't get it back. Every, I, I can drag it over, but every time I release it, it shoots back to that side. So, okay. Do you happen to have a PowerPoint remote? Well, yes, I do. Okay. Can you make sure, number one, there's not a piece of paper on top of it, and number two, it's turned off? Because what would happen is they'd ta- they'd give a presentation, they'd toss the remote in a drawer, and it'd be sitting on that little track point device. 
and it would hold their mouse in one direction. I have heard that story a million times, but it's the first time that that particular customer had called in with that particular problem. And so what we can't do is hear a customer complaint and go, I'm having a really hard time with my mouse and go, unplug your track put your, your, your PowerPoint remote. I don't have a PowerPoint remote because the one time there's a customer without a PowerPoint remote and now we snapped at someone and that's a problem. So believe what they say. Hey, I'm having a problem with your mouse. Oh, what is it doing? Please tell me more. I'm intrigued. Oh, every time I move my mouse, it's dragging to the left. Then ask a question, not an accusatory question, but a question. Hey, do you happen to have a PowerPoint remote? Well, yes, I do. Can you find that and make sure it's turned off, please? Also, make sure it's turned off when you're not using it because if you set something on it or it gets set upside down, sometimes the little pointer on that will cause your mouse to act to, to behave weird. Cool, you solved my problem and you were nice to talk to. Two birds, one stone. Nailed it. This man customer services. This man customers. This man managed customer service for <laughs> so long. <laughs> This man hired and fired people based on that, okay? <laughs> so. Uh, what are your beers tonight, Craft Computing? That's a fantastic question, and I'm really glad you asked, because I'm right there. He's got... Sorry, he's got... Uh, he's got a Fort, Fort George Fresh IPA. I am drinking a Monkless Belgian Ales. Hazy Day in Brussels, Double Dry Hopped, Belgian Triple. Tripel. Uh, and it's been delicious. Uh, as I said, this is a fantastic blend of a... I don't even want to call it a New England Hazy because it's not a New England Hazy. This is a, a straight-up Hazy IPA. Modern-day Hazy IPA. Post-2019 Hazy IPA. Um with some little Belgian artifacts in it. L little bit of ester, a little bit of a thick, thick mid malt body profile. Uh, it's been fantastic. And I'm about to finish it and open up my next beer. Uh, oh, that is good. Hey, it's not this, for nothing, but, uh, oh, go ahead. It's this really great combination because you get all of the hop and all of that like Belgian mid-body with it. Like you have the hops of a hazy IPA and it is very present and very in your face and very, um, but instead of like dying off or drying out or anything like that, like you like a super drying or, you know, whatever IPA, the it hits at the front and the body is super big and in your face and, and it yeah. doesn't fade. It's it's the perfect combination of those two beer styles. I, I absolutely love it. Anyway, what were you saying? Oh, nothing. I don't know. <laughs> Sounds like a delicious beer, though. Beer number two is a bit bigger. Oh, boy. Um, oh, boy. I didn't even check the ABV because I knew it was up there. 11.9. Uh, from Sierra Nevada, it is their barrel-aged narwhal, and I've already opened it, so no take backsies. Uh, and this one has been in my fridge for two years. This is the 2021, uh, Sierra Nevada narwhal barrel-aged stout. What's really fun is it still pours with that big of a head after being in my fridge for two years. <laughs> By the way, this is my Code Rain glass. This is the Matrix inspired, insp inspired, inspired uh, code glass. Uh, why do I have a, a code glass? Well, for some people it's hardware, for some people it's software. There you go. Uh, but this is my stout style glass, a uh, little Nonic pint. Uh, also available, craftcomputing.store. 
Uh, and it's fantastic, and it's full of Easter eggs. Like, Raid is not a backup. And what's a Ventoy? Raid is a backup, though, if you use it right. Raid is part of a backup solution. It is, in and of itself, not a backup. <laughs> I am just kidding. <laughs> yeah, five years into graphic computing, and I'm going to die on this hill, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Lord. You're still waiting for widescreens to fade. I don't know when I can go back. You I'm know what's funny is is LG did their damnedest with the 18 by 16 displays. Remember those? <laughs> I so wanted those to take off. I had three different companies reach out with review samples, and none of them ever showed up. Oh, come on. Most recently, like three weeks ago, I got someone who goes, hey, we have an 18 by 16. And I went, I've been wanting one of those forever. I'll give you a good review. I don't even care because I know where you sourced your panel. Please send it. Two weeks later, I say, hey, did you have a shipping note with that? I, I, I haven't seen it show up yet. And they went, oh, we ran out of review samples. So you mean uh. you emailed me and within three hours, I respond and say, yes, I will absolutely review this monitor. And then you go, we ran out of re review samples. You know, I I can't even count the number of products when I was the one sitting in the chair answering yes to those emails for you. Uh, I can't count the number of those products that I said yes to that just never, ever showed up or there was a number of them. It's a surprisingly high ratio. It's It's really high. At least when I was doing it, I remember it was like for every every yes. Well, let me think about this. For every product that showed up, there was like legitimately like seven, eight, nine, maybe even ten that just never did. Right. Uh, one that really sticks out was that uh, there was a short throw projector um, that never showed up. Yep. Yeah there there was uh, a a four K short throw projector. Uh, it was a laser projector too. Uh, yeah. that was supposed to be there. Uh, never showed up. Completely ghosted us. Completely um, ghosted. Uh, there was a company that I had worked with a number of years that had an uh, an 18 by 16 uh, uh, display. And we said, please send that over. And they said, okay, as soon as samples are ready, we'll send it over. And then like over six months, like I sent them one email a month going, hey, you ever going to ship this? And I... Meanwhile, I see reviews popping up on other channels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, uh, hello. Yeah. Or my favorite is like, we, uh, you know, the number of times too, I'd be like, yes, we're interested in doing this. And then they'd be like, oh, actually, we're going a different way with uh, with this marketing campaign. Uh, yeah. Maybe next time. Like, come on. Why'd you reach out? Uh, Mara Trunks has a fantastic question. Craft Computing, how long do you keep personal data from the orders, i.e. names, addresses, emails? Um, I will be 100% transparent here. I use Square uh, for my point of sale transactions. Uh, my website is hosted by Square. Uh, they take a certain percentage of every transaction that takes place. Uh, myself, I keep the files basically as print only. Uh, when an order comes in, I physically print out the the PO uh, and uh, about twice a week we will print out an order sheet of how many items need cut uh, we produce those items we put a PO with the items we put the PO in the box with the items and we ship them I personally save no data whatsoever the data does exist on squareup.com which is who hosts my point of sale system uh, but it's not like I am personally keeping your your personal information. I don't need that kind of liability in my life. Yeah. So there you go. Uh, the the only exception to that is for transactions that are done over PayPal. That is linked to my PayPal account, and I do receive uh, transactions via PayPal with your info and with your shipping info. But again third party. I have access to both systems, but I don't actually keep a copy on hand. That exists purely within Square and within PayPal in, in and of their own entities. So I hope that's what you were asking and I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that's a good, that was a good question actually. I never, I didn't think about that. 
Yeah. No, it's a fantastic question because who knows how I'm hosting the data, how I'm conducting card transactions. Am I self-hosting? Am I not? Am I doing all this kind of stuff? Um, yeah, Tripic says, uh, for my work, we legally have to keep records for seven years. Um, and yeah, for a lot of financial transactions, that's that's a very similar thing. Uh, you know, it, for medical stuff, it's, it's seven, 10, 15 years in some industries. Um, this is all transactional financial data that is all kept on third-party systems. The only time I interact with your data is when I print it off, it sits on my desk until I ship your product. And then that paper gets put into your product packing list uh, or gets put into the box that ships to you. That's all I ever see your personal data myself. So there you go. Boom. Great question. Now, me personally, I use all of your personal data to, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not really kidding, but I am. Um, why not maintain a CRM record? Because I don't think spam email works. Well, Jeff, the numbers disagree. The numbers disagree. Here's the deal. I would much rather post a video about how I have a new product coming out. Because that'll reach people who actually want to buy. Yeah, but what about when YouTube goes kaput? Then what? You're going to wish you had this list. Then I'm going to go back to IT management. <laughs> Look, I have my issues with YouTube and, and I've had a number of people go, why don't you just move platforms if you hate YouTube and you hate Google? I hate YouTube. I hate Google. I, I actively say that. I will actively say that until the day I die. And I'm saying this on YouTube right now. Um, the problem is discoverability of new audience. Who's going to discover my content if I'm on craftcomputing.com? But also, who are the people that are saying go to an, a new platform? Because what is that platform? Like, dude, I watch videos all the time, eight second clips on this website, man. Just break your videos into eight second clips. It's not a big deal. Uh, there's four websites, man. And we're on one of them. It's called YouTube. There's another one called Facebook. And uh, if, if you want to find a, a market for your videos, you got to play ball. I don't know, man. I I, I love I I personally pine for the days when there was uh, more than four websites. Maybe we'll get there again someday, but uh, yeah, for now. Um, for now, you put them on YouTube. <laughs> Here's the deal. Um, I have thought so many ways about how to monetize my platform outside of YouTube. I'm probably someone who's given it more thought than you could possibly imagine. Uh, I got copyright struck at the beginning of this year. Yeah. For a yeah. for a BS reason. Uh, and I'll just say it from Bethesda. Bethesda Zenimax. Zenimax. Bethesda Zenimax issued a copyright strike on my channel and YouTube obliged and added a strike to my channel. I was one third of the way to having my channel permanently deleted. Do you know why? Because I talked about Fallout 76. Yeah. Did I show video? Did I show clips? Did I infringe on their copyright whatsoever? No, I did not. But you know what? YouTube issued a copyright strike. A copyright strike in and of itself hurts you. Yeah. It, 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 hurt, it hurts your discoverability. It hurts your recommendations. And when I started asking questions, when I emailed ZeniMax directly to their press line and said, hey, I don't know if you know what you did here, but I'm well aware of DMCA, copyright law, and everything pertaining within it. I would like comment on why you copyright struck my video. The copyright strike was immediately revoked. Yeah. Uh, I also reached out on Twitter, Zitter, and uh, complained about it. And uh, I got a couple of other creators who were also caught up in this copyright strike. And the official response from Zenimax was the copyright strike was issued from a third party 
trusted with copyright management. Yeah. The strike has been removed. Of course. Of course. <clears throat> That's the razor's edge that you live on when you work in content creation. So, should I pack up my bags? Should I leave YouTube? Should I do whatever else? Here's the problem. 60% of my revenue is the ads that I sell. It's the ads that I sell directly to the companies like Linode and, and Fractal Design and NordPass and Manscaped and, and partners like that that have Patriot. Not and, Mint Mobile, that's for sure. Not Mint Mobile, that's for sure. Uh, by the way, I think I'm actually going to just post that video. <laughs> yes, finally. I think I'm going to. <laughs> Nothing saying I can't. Why not? Who cares? So I think I'm going to post that video. They um, copyright strike us. <laughs> they can't copyright strike me for anything in that video. Yeah. At this point, yeah. it's parody, which is perfect. Yeah. <laughs> um, but 60 to 70% of my revenue is selling those ads, is selling those 60 second pre uh, post roll ads, uh, or pre roll ads is what they're known as. Uh, they run after the intro before the main content. Their pre-roll, um, sixty to seventy percent of my revenue. Do you know why I can sell them for that price? Because of the viewership that I get on YouTube. Because that ad goes out to fifty thousand people every single time. Do you know why I can't move to a different platform? It's because my revenue, regardless of subscribers, regardless of people who are willing to pay for my content, regardless of. Uh, PR companies and companies directly that would sample me products also expect 50,000 people to view that thing. I wouldn't be able to deliver that on any other platform. I'm, I'm also interested too, like, this is a good example. It's like you had a pretty sizable following on, uh, on Twitter. And since Twitter has... Um, become less good than it was have you noticed a sizable hit on it and if so have you been able to like regain any significant amount of traction on another social media platform that isn't youtube no yeah um because i grew on youtube in an interesting way i grew on youtube because of a couple hit videos um i mean because of quality content through in and throughout. And that's kind of what you need to sustain growth. And I have always sustained growth. Um, less than 14 days I have ever shrank in my channel's history. No. Uh, every single day, every day, every individual day has been a positive growth on this channel as far as subscriber count and viewership. Every literal day. Um, and that's something not a, not a lot of people can say. That's something only the successful channels can say. Uh, there's a reason I have 330, what, 2,000 subscribers now. Uh, and I've never seen a dip in subscribers. I've seen the number not grow as quickly. I've seen the number grow by only 1,000 people a month. I've also seen the number grow by 10,000 a month. It's because I'm constantly in the heading in the right direction. Um, with, with the... Uh, with the change of like google podcast going away or something like that i had to we had to migrate one of my podcasts back onto youtube after several years uh and it was really funny um looking at my viewership stats since the migration is done today and i think like the official the plat the other platform i can't remember what it is if it's like youtube podcast google podcast whatever it's done it's dead now our podcast is available on YouTube as well as other platforms. But I was looking at the analytics. And it was like, uh, you had a 50,000% growth in viewership. And it's like, a f <laughs> it's like a handful of viewers. <laughs> but it was so funny, just like how it went from being a platform we didn't use <laughs> to like 50,000. I was like, this is almost insulting. They didn't have to <laughs> put it that way. <laughs> I was like, okay, 
like I'm sure some people like seeing those numbers, but that number is so large that it feels like a slap in the face. Like pump the brakes, YouTube. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Fifty thousand percent increase in your average viewership. <laughs> Wait till you see the 20,000 decline the week after. <laughs> yeah, I know, exactly. <laughs> oh, God. This made me laugh so hard. What's really funny is I really can't view my viewership growth over time because there's like three or four outliers that are such outstanding outliers, and I cannot yeah. filter them out that everything else looks like a flat line. Yeah. Um, I have four videos that are over a million views at this point. I have a, uh, I have the 2.6 million for wish.com. I have a 1.4. Uh, on, let me, let me look One this up. One of these is about accurate. windows. Cut the windows bloat, right? Eh? One, actually, yes. Yeah. Uh, one of them is the, the D bloat windows video. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so wish.com, 2.53 million. Uh, how the Verge PC should have looked. So when oh, the yeah. Verge did their video, uh, I did a reaction video where I redid what their video should have been. Uh, that is 1.5 million views. Uh, you're running Pi-hole wrong, 1.2 million. And debloating Windows 11, 1.0. Uh, and then everything else is 725, 690, 679, 631. Still sizable views. Um, I've also got the LTT uh, Oregon Wildfire PC that I collaborated with LTT on. Uh, that's at just over 500,000. Um, has double the comments of half the videos in front of it uh, at 2,800 comments. Uh, but uh, that was also like in a two-day span. So that's one of the videos that is like this vertical peak on my long running viewership. Uh, the other ones are the wish.com, how the Verge PC should have looked. And, uh, and there's a couple others that are kind of outliers and it makes everything else look literally like a flat line with hairs coming off it like this. And that's, that's what my viewership looks like. But how do I grow a new audience? If I was not on YouTube, let's say some of my content went viral and I was posting on Vimeo or Floatplane or something like that. Hey, cool, we need to subscribe to Craft Computing. Oh, it's behind a paywall? Ah, oh, screw that. Bye. Yeah. Matlock is a fan of your Verge video. Yeah. Oh, I remember those days. Okay. Okay. No, I heard. I heard things hitting the floor, so. Yeah, me too. It was the sound of... Uh... You drop in the challenge to the verge, hit the floor. That's right. Yeah. Please, please don't do TikTok. Um, Too I'll late. <laughs> <laughs> you, you do TikTok. Um, <laughs> here's the deal. Um, eventually, I'll probably have to because short form content is all the rage. If you've noticed, I don't post a lot of short form content. My videos are 20 minutes long. And the reason they're 20 minutes long is because of the things that we explained earlier when I was doing keyboard reviews. I need I to explain the context of how I'm reviewing this item, why I'm reviewing this item, whether or not this item works for me, and whether or not I think this item will work for you. Back when I was in the studio every day, I was like, all right, Jeff, is there a, way, is there a clip we can take from this video? Is this mm -hmm. a TikTok clip? Can we mm -hmm. do that? It's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> do you remember the couple of times we tried to produce a TikTok? Yeah, we did like we did one together, and then you did the uh, the remote one, and that was it. That's the only yeah. two that are even. Yeah, okay. do you remember it was like I can't get this below four minutes? Yeah, it was a challenge. Yeah. Eventually, we finally were like we like looked at each other, and it was like just do this, and it was like okay, 
Yeah. And it worked, but yeah, it was when we were building heavy metal to go to yeah. PDX land. Yeah. Yep. And, Please do uh, raid Shadow Legends. Um Here's the deal. 18,000 views. I don't need to personally use an advertiser to advertise for them. What I will stop short of is saying, I wake up every day and play Raid Shadow Legends. <laughs> hey, look how great my pubic hair looks. I use Manscaped every day. Um, there's a difference between an endorsement and a testimonial. What a lot of companies want is testimonials. I started using AG1 and it absolutely changed my morning routine. I now wake up with a healthy green blob of... I say this because I did an AG1 commercial in which I got approval for putting AG1 in a beer. <laughs> Remember that? That was fun. That was fun. That was one of my favorites. That was fun. Um, I did I say like... I wake up every morning and I drink AG1? No. no. Do you know what I said? Healthy lifestyle starts with AG1. You can pour it into whatever liquid that you want, mix it up and, and start your day. And, and never once did I say I do this. And that's the difference. I don't mind advertising space on the channel. I don't even mind it being in my voice. I will never sit up here and say, I play Raid Shadow Legends. Because I don't. Well, you're missing out. If Raid Shadow Legends wants to advertise their their latest pack and latest set of heroes and latest gameplay mechanics and things, be my guest. I'll even recite it for you. What I will never say is I do this if I don't. Tara yeah, says, I couldn't believe you did the Manscaped product. Those have been a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, that's one of my favorite videos that we did to get. We, always, we had too much fun with the ads when I was in the studio every day. Because uh, that Manscaped one got down and dirty, man. Like, <laughs> uh, we had, You have like... no idea how long my studio smelt of dill. <laughs> well, I do, because I was there. <laughs> <laughs> it's like three weeks later, I'm still smelling dill. But man, like Jeff bought this electronic saxophone. And <laughs> I just remember like we're doing manscaping. And I, was like, <laughs> and I was like, I don't know, man. I don't know how we agreed on the idea of like smooth jazz or whatever. That being like the, the, the way that we worked, the angle that we worked from. But the moment that I realized that we could use that that electronic saxophone i was like this is funny it we have to doesn't get funnier than an yeah. electronic sax <laughs> <laughs> like and it was cool and that's jeff actually playing the dang thing in the ad too so if you guys go and find that one i love the uh, people who commented on some of the keyboard yes. reviews that i've done recently who say well you just don't know how to type or you're not you, you don't have enough dexterity uh, oh, to do yeah, that yeah that's it i play clarinet motherfucker <laughs> <laughs> you have no idea who you're talking to, okay? In high school, for three years running, I was the number one clarinetist in the state, okay? I chaired my junior year the All Northwest Orchestra. I was the first chair clarinet. The first chair. The one who gives the tuning note to the rest of the band. Me. It's like people who tell Steve Hofstetter, you know, I make more money than you. I'm on television, mother... <laughs> 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 no, you don't. <laughs> By the way, the clever verbiage that we used in the Athletic Greens ad was just add just add one scoop to a glass of water or other liquid. Or base. other liquid, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't think AG1 is going to come back to me for an ad, so can I just say, that was vile. Yeah. 
Somebody asked. They they just said uh, it was uh, Matt Kyler. Can I can I just know what an AG one beer tastes like? <laughs> I'm so certain he almost gagged it up as soon as we got. That was vile. <laughs> <laughs> so for those who don't know, I put a full tablespoon into a into a pilsner. We can't use. We could not use the original scoop because as soon as it hit the beer, it went. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and foamed for like five minutes. It was like a volcano <laughs> oh. experiment in middle school. Yeah, the Mentos and Coke type thing. Oh, oh my, God. my God, that was so bad. And so what you see is me dropping it in and then a nice fade cut to me stirring it. The stirring was like 12 minutes later. <laughs> there was oh, no carbonation so left in that beverage. <laughs> so good. Somebody says, what did AG1 taste like? I never tasted it personally, but I remember it's just smelling like, like, I don't know, ground up vegetables, basically. I don't think it was anything special. A lot of people chiming in with uh, with band life, first chair woodwinds for life. I see you, Remy. Uh, Vast CNC says band nerd here, drumline. Uh, I also did drumline. I did marching band. I did uh, a number of different things. I played marching quads for a year. Yeah, I, I did all that kind of stuff. Um, I was uh, the lead snare in my drum line. Nice. <laughs> get with it, Jeff. Nice. <laughs> what do you have? One note? Come on, get on my level. <laughs> I mean, yes, but I played it a lot. Right. Okay. right. <laughs> um. Uh. For those who don't know, both Rhett and I are are actually fairly well accomplished musicians. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I would say well accomplished for myself, but have you, you. <laughs> have you worked at a professional level? I have, yeah. Then you are an accomplished musician. <laughs> I never take away from that because everyone has their own level of success and someone paid you to do it. So there you go. I think my favorite music credit, though, goes in the Manscaped ad when I was like, we got to figure out how to work the lick into this. The lick. We got to get the lick in here. <laughs> um... My my favorite piece of that is he says the lick and I went, we got to get the lick in there because <laughs> me and my friend, uh, my friend Corey, my, one of my best friends in 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 high school band and jazz band and all the ensembles that I used to play in, um, we used to go and listen to other bands and one of the things we would do is we would point out when they did the lick and oh he did the thing he did the thing like it, it was a meme before we knew what memes were because it's the lick. <laughs> um. Da, 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 da. That's the lick for those who don't know. Um, and uh, so we would point it out in every solo. We'd start laughing and pointing and everything else because, oh, someone fit the lick into a jazz solo or into this ensemble or to this this big band piece or whatever. Um, and, and Corey was the only person I could think of when I was trying to figure out how to fit this into what I was doing on that. Um, but... Uh, yeah, so so not only did I I actually play the electric saxophone, which was a Yamaha WX5, um, I also memed the music. So there you go. <laughs> oh, it was fun. Um, yeah. How many instruments do you play, Brett? Uh, realistically, um, I only play drums and guitar. Realistically, it's um, fair enough. Yeah. I'm really not well, and I, I guess like percussion in general. When you look at it that way, because yeah. that, that's what I did professionally was like percussion. Yeah. Um. But yeah, uh, as much as musically inclined as I am, uh, never picked up a wind instrument, never picked up a horn. Uh, my prim to. my primaries were were clarinet and bass clarinet, um, and uh, I. Believe it or not, I was actually better on the bass clarinet than I ever was on clarinet, but clarinet gets more solos. And so that's that's where I used used to levitate to. Um my junior year, I was the uh chair clarinetist, the first chair clarinetist for the uh U of O Summer of Bands, SOB. Um it was a, a high school invitational. Uh, as well as Wibbick, Western Inter International Band Clinic. Uh, I was the the first chair clarinet for that. What's really fun is uh, I also had a really good friend named Emily, who we had the same private instructor, and her and I were 1A to 1B. We would show up 
for random events and figure out which one of us was 1A and which one was 1B because we always sat okay. next to each other and it was always the first or the second chair. Uh, and so I would show up and I'm like, oh, your audition tape was slightly better even though both our instructor recorded both of us. Like, I'm going to have to talk to her about that. <laughs> and, uh, so shout out to Emily. You were amazing. Um, but uh, yeah, so... Uh, Summer of Bands and Western International Band Clinic, three-time Wibbick, uh, two-time Summer of Bands, uh, first chair clarinetist. Um, uh, All Northwest twice on bass clarinet. Uh, I also played, I own a basset horn. Let's just leave that there. I own a basset horn. Um, I play all the saxophones from soprano to baritone, uh, soprano, alto, barry, tenor, uh, probably tenor is my primary, but, uh, but I've spent time on all of them. Um, I'm a, I'm an okay. I'm okay on a drum set. Like if you put me down and you need a two, four rock beat, I'm your guy. Like I, I can do, I can do some very generic, uh, Casio keyboard level <laughs> drum beats. Um, I'm actually very good at percussion in general. And so you want to put me on bells, on chimes, on timpani, on quads, on marching bass snare. I can totally do all of those. Don't expect them all together. And that's what I that's what I consider the drum set. So I, I can get these two limbs working for me. I can never get all four at the same time working in unison. Uh, so uh, I can I can tinker on a piano and a keyboard. Uh, I know enough to make me dangerous and sound really good and get me laid in college. Uh, and <laughs> I do play guitar, not, not at a like primary level, but enough to play just about anything you put in front of me. Uh, I'm not a lead guitar player. I am definitely a chorus guitar player, a, uh, a rhythm guitar player. Uh, and then bass. Bass is probably my primary, uh, most, most recently. Uh, where because I spent 12 years learning music theory, I make a wicked bass player. Where's this chord going? I already know. Cool. Let's go. <laughs> you need a foundation? I got you, bro. That's me. <laughs> That's the type of knowledge that goes a long ways. Mm-hmm. It's opened a lot more doors for me than I ever could ima imagine. So, hey, the way I've gotten all my music gigs was having a solid foundation on percussion, and uh, just always, you know, I would never say I was the best, but I was always like second best, and I always answered my phone and always said yes. So when the first best guy couldn't make it, I could always make it. <laughs> And uh, and then you get these budget uh, you get these budget productions and they're like, well, can you play the entire uh, percussion section by yourself and a drum set? And you're like, well, yeah, we're gonna have to make some sacrifices, but of course I can. Right. <laughs> ah. And um, so that's where I fit in. And then you get because all the guys that were better than me, they're like, well, I don't want to do drum set and percussion. <laughs> I was like, suckers. I will give myself. An ulcer. Can we, uh, can we all attack Kyle in in the chat section right now? Uh, Want to buy a forty five drives HL fifteen that isn't marked up because they're all sent for free to influencers? Number one, <laughs> have you ever done marketing in your life? Um, do you realize if they wanted to actually pay me to do that ad, it'd be about eight grand. If they wanted to me to produce a video, it'd be about eight grand. You know what they did? They sent me two thousand dollars in hardware. Have you ever priced out a server in your life? And I mean ever in your life. Because I used to do it for 13 years. I know what servers cost. I know what building your own server costs. I know what BTO, I know what bring your own hardware. I know what system integration. I know what all of that costs. $800 for that chassis is a goddamn good deal. $2,000 for even, oh, you're only getting a six core Xeon that's so many years old is a goddamn good deal. Go price out any other server and come back. Your move. Uh, 
Uh, Ryan asks for a dollar ninety nine. Honest question: Is there anything you can't do? I don't like pickles. Tripic says, laughing at my average eighteen thousand dollar server cost. There you go. Also on an HL15 that isn't marked up. Go price out a brand new, mind you, brand new, manufactured, built, delivered, chassis. Chassis that is four mil thick, give or take, three mil thick, um, with rails. Go find a chassis that is actually up to that quality, that you would actually trust with 15 drives in it. I've had rose wheel chassis. I've, I've had a number of different chassis. I've, I've had in-wind chassis at $300 that I don't know that I'd trust to the weight of 15 drives. The only one that came close is the, uh, the Chenbro NR12000, which was a single U 12 bay do you know how flimsy that was trying to get into the rack? You could hook one ear into the rack and the other ear could be a U and a half removed. That's two and a half inches of flex in your one U chassis. And we accepted that. Do you know what's not acceptable in a chassis? The motherboard touching the chassis because your standoffs weren't tall enough and it flexed enough to short out your hardware while you were installing it. Do you know what's never been a worry to me about running? Are you saying Rosewood quality is bad? I'm saying it's bad. I'm saying it's not good. I'm saying I ran six drives and that was pushing it in a Rosewood chassis once. Damn. Kyle, all that, you didn't even super chat. Right. <laughs> if you think $800 for a chassis and $2,000 for an as-built server is a bad deal, You've never worked in this industry, and you never will. Oof. People are calling it really a rant alert. I didn't think it was quite to that level, unless he doubles down, which he tried to double down, but I already smacked him down more, so. At one point, you were clipping in my ears. I was like, all right, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> I got a compressor on the live stream. It's fine. Yeah, yeah, I don't care. I'm not worried about my ears, man. Yeah, we're that's good. How I know, that's not how I know we're in it. That's right. I'm just going to check Chen out. Bros are pretty solid. Have you priced a 4U Chen Bro before? A brand new 4U Chen Bro? Because I have. Guess what they are? About $600. Guess what they don't have? Sliding rails. Personally, uh, we've this got is why I let all my services exist on the cloud. Right? That's right. I mean, that's right. That's why I have Linode. Be real. I host them for you. <laughs> I have my own Linode and his name is Jeff. <laughs> JWS at your service. <laughs> HL 15 is worth the price. Sadly, too much for me. And that's fine. The problem is people are wanting 299 price points because they can buy a Super Micro 846 or or an HP DL80 or something like that for that same price point on eBay. Keep in mind, when those servers were brand new, they were like six grand. 799 for an as-built 15-bay chassis is insane. An as-built chassis on rails that can actually slide out of your rack and hold itself on rails without collapsing to the floor in a giant heap of parts that you just spent two grand for. It's only six cores and it's Cascade Lake. I know. And? It's a NAS. It's a NAS that serves files off spinning, off spinning disks. What more do you need? Do you think they're doing this as a goddamn charity? Do you think they're in it to make no money at all? 
Because I guarantee they could sell it for 1600 and make no money at all. Because I've seen their manufacturing inside and out. Also, as someone who worked in CNC and manufacturing, I understand that piece of the business too. As someone who does CNC and manufacturing in-house and makes his own merch, I've seen that side of the industry too. They could probably sell this chassis for 1600 and make not a single penny ever. Instead, they're selling it for 2000 as an as-built server, ready to drop in drives and ready for whatever you want to throw at it. It's a good deal. Go price anything else, I dare you. So. Tripic says, I'm looking for there. HL15s for our devs to use because they're so cheap. Tripic is someone who works in the industry, is someone who understands pricing, is someone who actually buys these things. The he HL15, the HL15, is it expensive for the average home labber? Yes. Is it higher quality earlier. than anyone has ever seen in the home lab scene before? Also, yes. Uh, Tripic said earlier, I take all of our interns into one of our server rooms and I, and I get them to guess the cost of the gear in the room. Then I blow their mind at just HDE hardware cost, HDE, just the hardware cost, let alone the licensing cost. Right. It costs more than the employees make to keep that server running. <laughs> Yep. Was that thud Jeff dropping the mic? I don't think this time it was. Hopefully not. The mic's on an arm and it's a really nice arm. <laughs> Let's say you want to build a P4 cluster with top of the line 2019 hardware. What do you reach for? Uh, Epic Roam. Uh, probably a 7742 thereabouts. You get 64 cores, 128 threads. You get 128 PCI Express lanes. You got, uh, what, seven PCI Express X16 lanes. You can fit seven P4s or, Lord help you, six P4s and some NVMe storage on top of that. So, yeah. Zachary chiming in. Saving the day. We do have some more news to get to, and I'd like to rapid fire it here in just a moment. Zachary chiming in with $50 on this Valentine's Day. I'm going to give that a heart because I can. Uh, happy Valentine's Day to Mrs. Craft. The woman must have so much patience to let weirdos on the internet do strange things to her husband for money and video cards. <laughs> <laughs> Rev says she's not the producer for nothing. <laughs> as, as the origin of the craft computing cat ears, you should know. <laughs> <laughs> there was a great exchange between Zach and I earlier this week. Um, so we often talk projects offline or, or in private chats. And uh, I told Zach I was buying a particular server because I wanted to try it out and wanted to see if it was something that might interest some home labbers. It is a dual node Epic server, 16 DIMMs per node. And so that is two individual PCs with dual 800 watt power supplies, each of which will support an Epic CPU and 16 DIMMs of memory. You could on a home labbers budget build 128 cores, 256 threads, and two terabytes of memory. The base server, bare bones, is 500 bucks. It's insane. It's an insane price for a server. And so I took a chance and I bid on eBay and I bought one. Um, Zach had posted some pictures of some drives that he was looking at offloading. And I said, dibs. And uh, he goes, are you really interested in those? And I said, I don't know. I'm waiting to get this server in. If those <laughs> drives fit my use cases, yes, I'll buy like six to 12, like depending on how many slots I can fill. Because uh, I want to have enough storage bandwidth to support whatever I'm throwing at this thing. And he goes, cool. Well, I'm driving to California and I'll be coming back home on Friday. Tell you what, let's meet up on Friday and let's figure it all out. And I said, perfect. 
And so I turned to my wife and I said, hey, on Friday, I'm going to go out to lunch with someone because usually I'm home for lunch. And she goes, with who? And I said, with the dude who made me wear cat ears on YouTube for the lulls. And she goes, oh, him. Meanwhile, Zach texted his wife and said, hey, I think I might be going out to lunch with someone on Friday. And she said, who? And he goes, well, I'm stopping in Salem. And she goes, oh, that YouTuber that you put cat ears on. (laughs) (laughs) Our wives get us, and that is very rare. (laughs) So thank you. Uh, Windows 11 24H2 goes from unsupported on old PCs to unbootable on some old PCs because of some instruction set updates required in the bootloader. This is being made a bigger deal, in my opinion, than it actually is. Here's my theory. Uh, Windows 11 was never supported on a Core 2 Duo. Ever. Windows 11 requires TPM 2.0. Unless you happen to bypass TPM, Tamper Protection Module 2.0 support. Uh, In which case, you can install it on just about anything. So long as it has SSE2 instruction sets. Which every processor since the Pentium 4, circa 2001, has had the instruction set for. You can install Windows 11 on a Prescott P4. I guarantee you. It'll run. It won't run well, but it'll run. Uh, Latest update for Windows 11, 24H2, now requires uh, POPCNT, otherwise known as Population Count. It's an instruction set that was regulated as of the SSE4, uh, if you're AMD, or SSE4.2, if you're Intel, instruction sets. SSE4 was implemented with AMD in their Athlon 64 lineup, circa 2006. SSE4.2, as of the core series of lineups, as in the core i7-920 Nehalem CPU from 2008 from Intel. If you have a system that is running Windows 11 that doesn't have SSE4, You shouldn't have been running Windows 11. This title is entirely clickbait and applies to like 0.2% of the population. I understand unbootable and unsupported are kind of like interchangeable with some folks. Unsupported means you didn't support the instruction sets to begin with. Unbootable means screw you, we now need that instruction set to boot from. That's kind of the difference here. But if you have a CPU prior to Nehalem that you're running Windows 11 on, bravo, you've won it life already. It's time to cash in and buy a CPU that's capable of SSE4. Uh, population count counts the number of bits in a machine word that would have been sent or different from zero. Uh, you might see it in cryptography and has been lurking in CPU architectures for years. Yes. Um, it's why modern CPUs are good at cryptography is because they can kind of like a, a, an old school number cipher or letter cipher, you know, We have one through 26, let's offset by seven and then count the difference. It's the same kind of cipher. It's the same kind of A equals E uh, as you were in a cryptography, although way more complex. Uh, It's the reason that instruction set has existed since 2006. Uh, Yeah, if you're running a Core 2 Duo processor and you're trying to run Windows 11, might be time for an upgrade. I'm just saying. Uh, HP DL580G7 might not be the one you're talking about. Runs $250, not bare bones. Can go up to 40 cores and 2 terabytes. Uh, I'm assuming 2 terabytes of memory. So hold on. DL580G7. 
That is a... Probably an X79 build. Oh, an e it's an E7 processor. Sandy Bridge. Okay. Sandy Bridge tech. I don't know why you're tagging me in this. Honestly. 40 cores, 2 terabytes. Yeah. It supports dual 10-core processors on the E7 5850 or 4850, uh, 4870, 2.4 gigahertz. It's Sandy Bridge with hyper-threading. And that's it. Um, and it's an E7, so it can go... The E7's lineup of CPUs was the larger socket set. It was the 2011-1 socket set, which was never known to consumers because it can scale to four CPUs, which is why we have CPU names like the E7-4870 and the E7-8837. Um, it's a Sandy Bridge chip. It's a 2011-0 SKU. It's a V0 SKU. Uh... That's still capable. It's a core processor. It's a core processor with SSC 4.2. Sandy Bridge is two generations from Nehalem, believe it or not. There was Nehalem, there was Westmere, and then there was Sandy Bridge. Sandy Bridge is that Gen 3. They call it Gen 2 because we ignore Westmere altogether. So yeah, uh, if you're reading the headlines about Windows 11 going unsupported to unbootable, it's not really a concern outside of 0.2% of the population. And those 0.2% probably should still be running Windows 7 on a closed environment. Just saying. <laughs> I was going to say, it's a concern for me, Jeff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Case closed. Would you give it a week? Jesus. <laughs> Look out, NVIDIA, and Microsoft is reportedly working on its own DLSS rival. I'm actually really excited for this one. Uh, so Microsoft is looking at basically implementing their own AI-driven frame boost, frame generation, frame super sampling uh, technology into DirectX. And that's cool. Uh, that means... If you're DirectX 12, 13, whatever the next number, 12, 1, 12, ultimate, I don't, I lost count of the marketing terms. Um, you'd be capable of doing this regardless of your hardware support. If you are supporting DirectX 12, you are supporting this technology. And that's cool. The more players we get into this kind of game, the more we can take advantage of it as consumers. And look, while DLSS in the review game gets a lot of negative press, gets a lot of negative uh, scrutiny, it's just fake frames if they're doing frame generation. It's only rendering at such and such resolution. It's just upscaling to this. When has upscaling ever been a big deal? Remember Halo rendered at 540p and rendered and actually displayed at 1080? No one gave a crap on the original Xbox. No one cared. Because in the end of the day, it was still a good looking image. Look it up. Halo rendered at 540p. Um FSR 2.0. Intel XESS, NVIDIA DLSS, they are all hardware tie-ins in some sense. They're all requiring you to have a buy-in to a certain technology, to a certain architecture of hardware, and able to use it. If Microsoft is able to ball in a very similar upscaling technology into, Direct into DirectX and utilize that not only in Windows, but also on Xbox. That's a win for consumers. I have never been playing a game. Ever. And started pixel peeping. 
I've noticed anomalies for sure. I've noticed shimmering artifacts. I've noticed ghosting, uh, most notably in uh, Starfield. Starfield, when you enable FSR, has some ghosting with the skybox in some uh, high-rise buildings. I've noticed it. Do you know what I did? I turned FSR off in that instance. Or I ignored it. Because my gameplay also went from 40 to 80 FPS on that monitor. So I didn't care. You know what's always had artifacting and and weird graphical anomalies? Hardware rendered graphics. Software rendered graphics. Let's go back to the early days and, and why graphics are the way they are. You take the good with the bad. If you want FSR enabled, cool. Maybe there's some artifacts. Maybe there's the occasional thing that goes, hey, wait a second. But maybe it also doubles your frame rate and you're fine with it. Uh, after 12 years, Zelda speedrunners have made a discovery in Ocarina of Time. I hate the term with a technique discovered by accident. No. Every discovery leads to another discovery. Something, especially when it comes to speedrunning communities, is never just a standalone thing, a weird glitch that we ignore entirely. Um... In the case of Ocarina of Time, it has completely obsoleted the glitch known as Ganondor. We're going to get into some deep lore here. You ready? We now have Ganon Floor. Ganon Floor has obsoleted Ganondor. Why is that? Well, arbitrary code execution or stale reference manipulation, SRM, ACE, they're both kind of in and of a nutshell the same thing. It is reading from an address in memory that has been overwritten with a value that shouldn't belong there and referencing an item in which it shouldn't reference. So the current speed run or the previous speed run for Zelda uh, used a, a technique called Ganondor in which you would enter the Deku tree, fight Goma, and then during the Goma fight, you would perform a series of moves involving a bottle, a dropping of a collection of bugs and the ocarina which you shouldn't have yet uh to cancel out a warp that would take you out of the deku tree and place you where you should be in the game instead exiting from you that warp performing a series of moves walking through the door and warping to ganon's tower as it's collapsing all of the last five minutes of the game why did that happen because during a sequence of moves in Ocarina or in, in that fight, you have been setting up memory in a certain orientation and fashion and, and order that would write a value to the warp destination that would change from outside the Deku tree and triggering a cutscene to Ganon's tower collapsing. You walk outside, you kill Ganon, game's over. That's been the fastest run up until recently. Uh, the new strategy has found a faster way because in Ocarina of Time, in that run, you still had to exit uh, the Kukuri Woods. You still had to get the Ocarina. You still had to collect bugs. You still had to get bombs. You still had to get a number of different items uh, in order for it all to work. Uh, the new one takes place in Dodongo's Cavern. And... There's an old glitch that was discovered 12 years ago that was very much well known about, but also, and has been used in speedruns before for duplicating items in a map. And that is leaving a map, leaving a world, and then re-entering that world and forcing it to reload all of its assets. And so instead of one actor in this position, you now have two actors in the same position, and then three actors, and then four actors, and then five actors. And 
as new data gets written to the scene that you're in, it can overwrite other values. Someone found out that if you reload the Dongo's Cavern three times without actually triggering an exit and re-entering the room, you load into a certain section of a bridge up at the top section a load screen, which you can jump through, pass through, and one of the values on the page happens to be the Ganon's tower collapse. So they finally figured out how to piece all of this together. Discovered by accident? Absolutely not. Found out that a glitch from 12 years ago applies to a speedrun today based on new knowledge? Yes. It's amazing. There's a YouTube video linked in the description. Go watch it. If you are at all a fan of speedrunning and memory manipulation and things like that, it is worth a watch. It is totally amazing. Uh, at the level of detail these guys go into and the setups that are required, the skill set that's required to actually pull off these glitches. It's so much fun. It's why I watch speedrunning in general. So go watch. And finally, last one. We can check another one off the list. Uh, I'm glad we have our news shtick. You know? Yes. In today's installment of What Weird Thing Has Someone Ported Doom To? Uh, according to Kotaku, this week is a Reddit user who has translated the game into an audio signal that can be displayed on a spectrogram. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not going to play the video. The sounds are atrocious, by the way. If you play the video, don't do it with headphones, number one. Uh, number two, <laughs> they have it's a, a little weird control knob. because every line that you see drawn here from right to left is scrolling across the screen like this. So every line gets drawn vertically and then the next line, it shifts over and then draws the next line. Um, and so uh, the audio has to play to represent each individual pixel. And so someone has written a version of Doom that can play an audio spectrum file that can color in indivi individual vertical pixels at a rate of around one frame per second, maybe even less. It might be like a half frame per second. Uh, and the screen scrolls continuously right to left. It just does... Here's, here's your bars as they're going across. That is a frame being drawn in front of you, but the next frame is following it. It's like a roll of film that you're out of sync with. <laughs> uh, but he can present inputs to this screen and play the game as it exists. And it's amazing. Video link is also down in the video description. Go check that out. I saw this one and couldn't resist. So. Spectrogram. Didn't see that on my 2024 bingo. Right, yeah. I bet Perfect. you can play that on your clarinet. Yeah, oh, I, you know, that's kind of funny. Using your uh, tones as controls. That might be kind of fun to play Doom based on uh, notes on a clarinet. I mean, I have the elect I have the WX5 and the WX7. It's MIDI. I can turn MIDI into joystick commands. That's not a big deal. Right. Um, what would be really fun is to map them to the intro music of Doom. Ba da ba da ba da ba da da da. -da. You know, th those like seven or eight notes, and those are all your different commands. And so, uh. <laughs> so the whole time you're just waffling between those notes. That could be funny. <laughs> um. If you didn't know, there is a Mario 64 drum percent category. Have you seen this? No. <laughs> drum percent. It is mapping a MIDI drum set to the controls of Mario 64 and speedrunning Mario 64 on a drum set. Of course. It was on GDQ uh, this, this past one. So go look that up. Uh, I love it.
you know, we did a pretty good show tonight. It was a good we show. Had a pretty consistently high viewership. Yeah. It was like above 200 most of the show. Yeah. I'm proud of that. Uh, recent shows have been. It, it, it's, it's, it's been a great growth uh, the last couple of months. Uh, for like a year solid, we were stuck in like the 100 concurrent. Yeah. And then maybe around since November, it's been a steady climb. And tonight, uh, we we peaked at 232. Uh, we've had 1,400 viewers in total. Uh, so yay you. Thank you all so much for tuning in. This has been yeah. fantastic. Uh, Get those likes up. Get those likes up. Get those likes up, yeah. Uh, there's only... Uh, 83. Likes 83 likes. Come on, guys. You're better than that. <laughs> There we go, 84. There you yes, go. Yes, what's up? Make sure to drop the stream a like if you liked it. Thank you so all for much. Thank you all so much for hanging out. Thank you so, so much, much hanging for out much. for the. <laughs> Hit the thumbs up, ladies and gents. Thank you so much, Aaron. You said it way better than I did. Uh, if you like this video, make sure to hit that thumbs up button. Subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Catch me on the social medias at Craft Computing. Uh, Rhett, have anything for the good of the order? Anything to plug? Any any other outlets that we can catch you at? Yeah, you know, I, I am not as active on Mastodon pretty much ever. Come find me on Blue Sky, which, um, you know, I've been enjoying while it was closed. Now it's open, so... Come join us over there. I'm at redisawesome.com because you can also find me at redisawesome.com. Hasn't been updated in a while, but that's where I'm putting all my um, project updates and things like that. And uh, you can check out my Dungeons and Dragons podcast uh, in at the end at dndpodcast.org. Check out our once a month live stream where we play other games. Uh, like we played Goblin with a Fat Ass, which was a really fun one page RPG by the creators of Lancer. And uh, last time we played Troika, which was a fun rules light RPG as well. So check those things out. Sweet. As always, thank you all so much for watching. Join us every Wednesday night at 6 p.m. Pacific time right here on YouTube or on your favorite podcast website, whether that be anchor.fm or wherever your favorite podcasts are found. And as always, we'll see you next week. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. This was a really good beer tonight.